or whiskey jason here whiskey from the viewpoint of an american i should have been in ireland last year just visiting many different distilleries but that bad c word made me change my plans and instead i get to have here who in front of the camera from blackwater distillery hello how are you very good. Peter, it's great to see you. Tell me a little bit about your position in this distillery and also maybe your story of how you got into whiskey. Um, I got into whiskey uh, a long time ago now, back when no one was drinking Irish whiskey. So 20, 25 years ago, I was living in London and um, I traveled a lot to Scotland. And I got a real sense of Scotland of how much they valued their industry yeah. and how in Ireland we didn't really uh, and I wanted to know more so I went looking for some books and the last book published was 1974 so I kind of thought oh this is not good enough so I started writing first of all a website and a blog this is back in, in 19, 1998 I think before people had much the way blogs that grew into a book grew into a couple of books and then that grew into the distillery that I'm sitting in right now here in, in Ballyduff in Waterford in Ireland. Excellent, excellent. So tell me a little bit about the story. How did you actually start the distillery and what type of obstacles did you have to overcome? Plenty of obstacles. Um, we started this back in 2014. So um, this will be, God, is that long ago? Yeah, 26, six years. Yeah. We spent the first three years with our head down making gin. So we make um, black water gin mm -hmm. in a variety of delicious flavors. And we also make another gin called Boyle's Gin, which we sell through Aldi in Ireland, UK, Australia. And um, that making that kind of put manners on us because you're dealing with a very large supermarket. So we had to think differently about how we operate. So we became quite sophisticated quite quickly. So we installed, we had built for us a bespoke bottling line, uh, which we have installed. And we quickly scaled up our production and the way we did everything to a level that would be satisfactory for a supermarket. So that for us is a very steep learning curve. Um, but it was, it, was, it was good, it was very valuable and it's paid off for us in the way we make whiskey, our approach is quite quite um, focused, shall we say. So that's kind of, so the business grew out of gin, but deliberately the long aim was always whiskey. But whiskey is a, an expensive, very expensive business, with very long pipeline, whereas gin is a rapid turnaround and response. So we're kind of right place, right time. 2014, 15, when we started production, gin was becoming big. And we were we were at there at the table, and um, we've had a good run. You have, yeah. <laughs> now let's go back to um, your books. Um, I just went to Amazon real quick because that's the best place for me to search your name and so on. And we have some books here. We have, for example, Bushmills: Four Hundred Years in the Making. You wrote that book. Yeah. Um, you also wrote the Whiskies of Ireland, which is an interesting, interesting book. And I thought you had a third one as well. Which one was that here? Yeah, that's the there, the pocketbook of Irish whiskey. Yeah. All right. Very, very good. The Irish whiskey guide there. So that's when you started at all those books. So you were an author first. Why were you not happy with just being an author? Why? Um, my background is in media production. So becoming a writer was was no big deal because every day working in TV, you write scripts. So writing for me was not difficult. But I just, you know, when you when you when something becomes slightly more than than a hobby and it starts becoming a passion, then naturally you want to be able to put your stamp on something. So um, I came home to my very understanding wife one day and I said, um, I want to set up a distillery. And uh, she went, fine. So yeah, here we are. See, my wife drew the line there. She says, I can buy bottles, I can buy barrels, but I cannot start my own distillery. That was, yeah. <laughs> she said, no, stop. <laughs> Very, wise very good. Yeah, very nice woman. I must admit that's true. All right, very, very good. Now, why Blackwater? Why this area? And once again, I'd like to show a little map of Ireland, if I may, for those of us who are not um, great with the geography here. If we take a look at Google, we can actually see that you're located fairly south, I would say between Cork and um, Kilkenny, 
and um, Waterford is, oh, Watford is over there, and you're smack dab in the middle there. But a beautiful, beautiful scenery with a lot of lot of lakes around there, right? Yeah, yeah, and we're in a lovely part of the world. I think it's the best kept secret in Ireland. If you look at that red mark is where I'm sitting right now, and right yeah. below us, about 100 meters of where I'm sitting, is the Blackwater River, yeah. which is in the photograph on your on your left there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a beautiful part of the world, and um, I live over the hill in County Cork, actually, so not, not far from here. This was always going to be the kind of place to do business. I preferred it to working in Cork because Cork, the nearest distillery to here is actually Middleton. I know the big uh, one. Yeah, right? I know. The nearest one to here is Middleton. So I didn't want to be in East Cork because Cork has its own story and there's plenty of food stories in Cork. Waterford, which is where I am now, um, is a different proposition. There, it's a very rural part of the world. We're an hour and 15 from Waterford City, so we're not really near the city at all. It's a very long, narrow county, so we're way out the arse of the county on the border with Cork. Uh, and it's a beautiful part of the world. There's a great food culture building here, and I thought it would be more interesting to be at the beginning of something, the beginning of a food culture to help shape it, rather than being yet another Cork distillery. There's Plenty of them, and they're all very good, but we're we're different. So Waterford was a great place to be, and we had great support from the very beginning here in the county, the local enterprise office and, and the council, and everyone's been fantastically helpful. So it worked out really well for us. Excellent. <laughs> Teresa says, this is in the world. Hey, Teresa! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Very good. So I think I originally had you, my first bottling from you was something called a Retronaut, a 17-year-old oh, single malt. Um, oh, yes. He's, he's together. Go get it. It. Very interesting yeah, thing. Yeah. I forgot to mention that beforehand. I'm sorry. <laughs> Peter got up and I think got four different bottles. Every time I mention something, he's like, wait, I'll go get it. Wait, I'll go get it, which was fantastic. So Norman, uh, um, Nomad, good to see you here. So that's that's the last book which came out about three years ago, okay. four years ago. And I stopped writing then because I don't think you can be a commentator and a jockey. Don't think it's fair because you're compromised. So I've hung up my, my golden pen and um, I now throw rocks from inside the industry rather than from outside the industry. So yeah, retronaut. Yeah. Basically, um, we were very keen at Blackwater not to release uh, a whiskey that we hadn't made ourselves because a lot of the distilleries in Ireland were doing that. They're building a brand by bottling liquid that isn't theirs, which is a fine business model, but it really wasn't for us. We thought we'd hang on with a couple of exceptions. But the, the exception, the first one was this, Retronaut. And the reason we did this, and it says so on the back of the box there, it says, um, we, 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 we bottled this to celebrate work starting on the distillery that I'm sitting in right now. And it goes without saying, we did not distill this whiskey. Well, no problem with-, with, with, with Transparency. Thank you very much. Just be honest with people. So that's retro now. There's not much of the left. Um, it's really lovely. It's really, really nice. Um, so yeah, we did that. Just to say, yeah, we're going to be in the whiskey business. This is to celebrate that fact. And to boot, it's a rather lovely design. And it's a rather lovely liquid. So, uh, And we also learned, because you know, making whiskey is w one part of the process. And in many ways, making it at this stage is the easy part. The difficult and the time-consuming part is everything else. It's all the, the logistics of the various licenses you need to to make whiskey because it's a it's got a technical file and, and and this geographical indicator you've got to deal with lots of people from you know the authorities that approve your labels all the way through so to do it on a dummy run was a really good way to cut our teeth to know what we'd be facing when we did it for real ourselves with our own liquid and to make all the mistakes on something small like that which we could just box off put away and not do again so then, excellent Excellent. Now tell me a little bit about the pot sills I see behind me. So if I just put me, um, mm. so this is these are actually yours, right? So tell me what they are and tell yeah. me when will we have the first whiskey here? 
Yeah, there are pot stills, and they were made by um, Frilly in Siena in Italy, which is a beautiful part of the world. And actually, I should be in Tuscany this week on my holidays because I like it so much. Yeah. But obviously, I'm not. I'm here instead. To you, which is <laughs> uh, the stills. Um, we were looking for stills, and I got a phone call one day from John Peeling saying, Peter, Peter, get on a flight and go to Siena and see Filippo because um, he's got some stills out the back. Um, would you be good for you? So I did exactly what he suggested. And the stills behind you were built in the late 80s. Um, yeah. So what, I, what we like, the fact is that they are very purpose. They were built initially for a grappa distillery in northern Italy called La Versa. I actually have a bottle in there. I won't go get it, but I have a bottle of the grappa that those stills made in their previous life. Um, so I flew over. They were in bits. They'd been sitting at the back of, of the distillery. And um, uh, Filippo and myself came to an agreement, and they were completely rebuilt for us. The great thing about a still is a still is a copper pot. That's it. It's just a copper pot. You can make anything in a copper pot. Um, so those cup, that copper is like that thick. Really? The wow! Thing. Much thicker than needed. It's beautiful, beautiful. But what they did was they 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 upgraded. So they put all new electrics, all new dials, all new seals. Everything was with you, and then the whole thing was taken and, and polished and brought over here and assembled by the guys at Frilly. So um, as a result, our whiskey is very very interesting. We, we, you know, a lot of people say. They reinvent the story and say our stills were designed this way to give us the spirit that oh bollocks. You don't know what whiskey a still will make until you turn the fucking thing on. You just don't know there's too many variables. Um, so from our point of view, it was worth taking a punt. We kind of figured that the spirit would be fat and oily because a pot still um a, a pot still grappa is is really quite oily. And unctuous, and that kind of suited where I wanted to take the company, which was to look at traditional postal Irish whiskey the way it should be made, and the way that it can't be made anymore, and to make it that way. So stills that were would, would produce a kind of a finer, oilier spirit was really kind of what I fancied. So we kind of lucked out, really, and they're great stills. And then you know they're completely over-engineered, which is brilliant. So the, if you here again, if you lean, lean this way, you'll see the cooling tower. This new part. Divided by a, a, a sort of a, a thing in the middle. Yeah. These are still their kind. I think they probably so let's do this here that way. So yeah. So. <laughs> there's, a, there's in the middle. There's a, a seal there. But mm -hmm. the top half is a, is a worm, an old-fashioned worm. Oh, worm top, basically, right? Yeah. For condensing. Mm -hmm. And the bottom is shell and tube, which is the modern way of condensing. We have the ability then to cool our spirit. Any number of ways. There's also coolant that into the head right behind you. So mm -hmm. there's that into that sort of tower, um, bubble there. Yeah, the onion. There's coolant in there. So depending on what you're doing and how what you're making, you can cool the liquid in the still. And then when it hits your cooling tower, it can be cooled in three ways. It can be cooled with just the worm, shell and tube, or a combination of both. And again, if you're making a, a fatter, oilier whiskey, you run it hard or you run it hotter. And you run it through the worm. You want something need lighter, like if you're making a malt, then you run it slower, you run it cooler, and most through the shell and chew. So we have amazing ability to adjust how we make our spirit as we make it. Uh, and as I said, I think we're probably the only people in the world who can do that. It's good fun to play. Hey, very, very good. So are you the master distiller then? No, no, no. I'm the, I'm the master chancer. Um, no, I'm I, I put the company together, but you know, I know the limit of my own abilities. And I did design, it's award-winning too, uh, um, but, you know, in theory, I could run a still. Yeah, I have all the theory, but I was very, very keen to not do it if I could avoid it because a lot of the things I can do, which would be like trying to build a brand and try to keep the company running and do all those kind of things that I'm used to doing. So we, I went looking for a distiller who could see the vision of what I wanted to make and how I wanted to do it, but who could make it happen. And my instinct was not to go to Ireland and not to go to Scotland, because if oh, you're Irish oh. or Scottish, yeah, it's, there's a way, of, there's, there's a methodology. It's like if you go into a Dublin airport and there's all the whiskey on the shelves, yeah? You kind of get overwhelmed because they all kind of look the same. 
Yeah, because it's the thing, it's a different group thing. It's a way of dealing with something. So when someone like Waterford come along and do it differently with a blue bottle, it's like, oh my God, look at that. No, 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 we can't see the no, no. whiskey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, they are brave enough to take a stand. But for them, but most of the people don't, and they just go to the regular bottle. And, and they got the same person who designs all the labels in Ireland. It's a legal requirement. Design that label the same as everyone else. Can make. So we want it to be a bit different. So that goes back to how we make the whiskey. And I went to America. Because America have the experience and the experience we've lost. We have dumbed down our whiskey. We have neutered our whiskey. We have made our whiskey uh, into like a cookie cutter thing. That's this is how you make it, and there you go. Someone who wasn't in that mindset, someone who had taken what the Irish started was mixed mashed little whiskeys. We had lost what we created, but we exported that knowledge to America. So all the knowledge of how to make the proper mixed mash bills is now in the States because that's what they do and they understand the concept. But we don't understand here anymore. In fact, it's completely been written out of history here. It doesn't exist, never existed. But America has it. So we hooked up with John Wilcox, who's the former head of Stiller at Rogue and various other places around the States. And uh, he said... It was like coming here would be like giving the keys to the Starship Enterprise. That were his words. Because whiskey nerd like me, and basically say, John, we want to make this kind of mad shit whiskey. You're the man to do it. And here's here's the stills, and here's the boy that talks about. And uh, he went, yeah. So he's behind that wall right now making it. Okay, very good. Now I went to your website. I see a different face here. I don't know who this guy is. Tell me a little bit about him as well. Your key people. So we have here the. The Kieran Curtin, yeah? Who's that? Oh, he's in jail now. Okay, good. We can go to the next topic, then. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not. No, to be fair, that, that we, we, we built that website, and we got a grant about five years ago to rebuild, to build that website. We haven't touched it since. Oh, okay. Error, way, there's no even mention of whiskey making in there. That I know, really, that's what I was looking for, nothing. I know, nothing there, no, no, we're terrible. This, this morning, I was rewriting that website. Okay. Anyway, so Karen, when we set up the company, there were four directors, four friends, myself, it's my wife, a uh, good understanding wife, uh, Karen, and a guy called Barry. So we all knew each other, we all worked in the media. And the four of us came together and found a black hole. So only two of us, or three of us now, because Caroline works in the movie, Karen and I were working here from the get go from 2014. Uh, and for the first couple of years, for no money at all. So uh, Karen and I um, were basically everything that happened within the four walls. It was myself and or Karen, just the two of us. Um, and Kieran still works here. Kieran now has taken over the gin portfolio. So he's the man who makes black water and boils and runs the bottling facility, which we have. And then John runs the whiskey enterprise. And then um, Caroline's our chief operating officer. She, she, she keeps manners and all of us. And I sit here talking shite. Exactly, with me, for example. All right, very good. Now, tell me a little bit, where do you source your grain now for your whiskey, and what would what is your whiskey production per year? Um, okay, two questions. First question, where do we source our grain from? At the moment, as of this year, all our grain is 100% Irish, and it's oil-grown forest. So that is unlike most distilleries. Um, we use malt, we use barley, but we also use oat, wheat, and rye. Those five, that's, that's, that's the history of Irish whiskey we're, we're, we're rediscovering. And so you're making single malt and single pot still, or just single yeah. pot still? Both, both. Okay. We, we've made a small amount of malt, not a lot, to be fair, but you kind of need a malt offering. So we have made some malt, and it's, it's perfectly lovely. But our real focus here, 90% of what we make is... Uh, what I would call a non non compliant pot still Irish whiskey. In other words, well, let's talk about that for a yeah. moment. <laughs> now, you have the technical file and you have your 5% other grains yeah. that are allowed, your 30% yeah. of this, 30% of that, yeah. either or. Yeah. Um, I was talking with John Teeling, and my favorite statement that he said is, I didn't think anyone wanted to drink pot still when we made that technical file. I was surprised. Whoops, I got that wrong. <laughs> and uh, now. <laughs> I think John John has been fair to himself. But to be fair, when when a certain large multinational company were rewriting history and and, and saying that the middle well is the only way to do it, John, to be fair, did stand up and did push back 
in those spirit association meetings back in 2014. And he was the only one, only other person at the table. I mean, amazing this that guy. Where, this is where it needs. To, this is where it gets interesting. The only people producing possible Irish whiskey at the time were Pernod Ricard. Only yeah. people, and everyone else sitting around that table who was using possible whiskey was getting it from them. Okay, to the monopoly producer. John wasn't, John was the only person who wasn't using their Postal Irish whiskey. He was pushing back against this. But because everyone else was getting their supply from this one company, um, we ended up in the shitstorm we're currently in, whereby history has been completely rewritten. And oat, seemingly, oats have no impact on Irish whiskey and never had. They only were used possibly for helping filter a, a mash ton or some similar bollocks. I mean, you can't explain something to someone whose salary depends on them not understanding. Bottom line. Very good. Now, um, going back even a little bit further, you write your whiskey without the E. Yeah. Now, um, tell me why, and then we'll talk about pot still in a second. Continue with that. Well, that's really, really simple. That's just, um, it's kind of to wave a flag because up until the early 70s, uh, Paddy whiskey was the last survivor made in Cork which was why when Irish whiskey tipped into Monopoly, there was one single producer and that producer decided henceforth it was all EY and everyone else is just near, just going, yeah, it's all EY. It was our way of going, we are no longer in a Monopoly situation. It is a legacy of Monopoly. It has no bearing on anything. And if the only effing thing you can say about Irish whiskey is if it's spelled EY, we're dead in the water. We're totally dead. And America, America. Oh, yeah, forgot that. And smooth. In America, where they can't decide how to spell the word whiskey, it is the most exciting category for world whiskey right now. America is buzzing with innovation because they're not hung up in that kind of shit. They don't care. It's like, well, what's the whiskey made from? And how is it made? And how does it taste? You know, that kind of stuff. That's what they're interested in. And that's what that's what impresses me and makes me excited to work with some of my bumble cups we have here. All right, so very, very good. Now, going back here to David, he said, what will your whiskey be labeled as if it's non-compliant pot still? And tell me why is it non-compliant? It's non-compliant because all the mash bills we're making here are historic mash bills. In other words, I have found them referenced in publications. So I have a recipe from a particular moment in time and often from a moment in time and from a particular distillery. So we would have the recipe, say, for how they made uh, pots of whiskey at almonds in Bandon or how they made it in Powers in Dublin in 19 whatever. So we have all these mash bills and we have a provenance for them all. And, and they're all labeled as pots of Irish whiskey. So that is, that's a matter of, that's a statement of fact. Okay. What's happened since then is that what's defined as pots of Irish whiskey has been rewritten. In other words, the, the name has been hijacked and, and attached to the product of one distillery. And the only people ever to have made whiskey in the way it is defined in the GI are middle. Okay, GI means? Geographical indicator. It's the European convention that underlines you the rule. It's the rule book. It's the recipe book of how you do something. And it's meant to be best practice. Ah. So yeah, so what can we call it? We can call it Irish whiskey, which is what it is, but it depends on how much trouble we want to cause when we release it. And a um, bit like what it's going to be called, what the brand is, it won't be Blackwater because we have issues with, with the mark in the States. Um, we don't know what it'll be called, but we know what it'll be in Irish whiskey. And at that moment, this moment in time, really that's all that matters. I'm not getting hung up about how we spell it right. All right, now, Kevin said you use barley, unmalted barley, wheat, and wheat. also oat. And oat. what was the fifth one? Rye. Rye. Oh, rye. like America. Rye, I love that. Now, um, very, very good. So why hasn't anyone been talking about wheat and rye? Everyone just talks about oats. Because oat is probably the most interesting of the other grains. And if you look at... The history of pots of Irish whiskey, I and mean, you can really only take it from 1823 um, because that's when the kind of the structure we have in place now was was established. So if you take from 1823 to, to today, which is basically nearly 20 years, and you look at all the mash bills across that period of time, 
up until till, till the, the, the GI, the technical file in 2014, you'll find the one consistent thing is oat. Oat is there in one form or another. I think it's Ireland's gift to the whiskey world. I think oat is really our USP in this country, but we, we've thrown it away. It's just, you know, it never happened. But what oat does, oat is, oat is a bugger to work with. It is kind of sticky. It lowers your yields, so you're, you know, you're less productive. But on the upside, you get a lovely, soft, creamy mouthfeel. And if you just go to the new release from John Shambo, their cost is at 5%. And even at 5%, it's there. But we're making whiskies here with close to 30% oat. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a very different proposition. Wheat, wheat is um, an outjump grain. Really, it, it, is, it and rye were never used in, in, in vast quantities. You're talking about maybe up to 5%. Oops, he's gone. I hope he comes back soon. <laughs> Oops, all right, good. You're back. So, no, wait, Peter, are you back? I can see the... Can you hear me? Yeah, you're back, sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. No, wheat, wheat and rye are, are nice. You think of them as, as like putting salt on your potatoes. You don't need much of them, particularly rye. It can be quite aggressive. And sometimes you find like rye and wheat work sometimes used interchangeably. I know they taste very, very differently, but you have the sense that sometimes there was a, a four or 5% floating other grain thing that distillers had and whatever they had. The other thing too is when you look at old mash bills from, from, from brew houses, they didn't have strict hard and fast rules. So you could have four mashes in the one day and each mash is slightly different. Be like, well, what have we got around? What's in that bag? What's in that bag? And then they would eventually, they blend them all out. So um, this idea of a strict 5% of the grains is just pull out of someone's arse. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, um, Bean Centauri, which is Kilbacon, had their yeah. single pot still with 5% oats now. The question that was here is from Glenn. Um, Peter, is the ex expectation that enough non-compliant successful brands and we can expect them to completely reevaluate the technical file? How will that happen and when will that happen, if at all? I don't think... The success or otherwise will have an immediate effect. What you tend to find, and this happened in Scotland recently, is that when the big guys begin to hurt, they suddenly, oh, we must change the technical file. That happens a lot in Scotland. They, they've revisited the technical file several times where it's suited the big players. Um, we can't change this on our own because we're just a small, small operator. But now there are more and more of us out there looking at this technical file going, what the hell is this? This has no bearing on reality. I think you will find the technical file will change over time because it is it is corrupt. And I use that word deliberately. It is corrupt and it does need to be overthrown. I think we can't do it in a run. I know we can't, but I know we can certainly lead the charge. All right. Very, very good. Now, David says here, do you think there should be an American standard labeling for things like rye whiskey? For example, my favorite will be a Kilbaden rye with about 30% rye, but it's still called a rye whiskey, which is a little bit of a stretch, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it is a bit of a stretch. Yeah, I mean, what you got to remember that multinationals really like things stacked in their favor. So, like in the States, if you're going to put caramel or coloring in your whiskey, you have to say it's there. Uh, I mean, i got Irish whiskey here. That's the color of some of the very, very bad kidney infection, where it doesn't actually mention oh, color in it anywhere. I wonder why, because it doesn't suit them. They don't like to talk about coloring. They don't like to talk about, um, you know, the the enzymes they use to, to increase their yields. They're the, they're the things we, we just brush under the carpet. And, you know, someone says, where is your barley come from? We like to buy our barley, we like to source our barley from within 20 miles. You, you may like to, it doesn't mean you're not doing it. So, you know, I, You've got to be very careful. We're just very, very open and transparent about everything we do. Anyone who wants to come here and look around, we we'll show you the mash bills, we we'll show you the stills, we, you know, we we'll show you everything. We have nothing to hide. You know, how many different styles of whiskey have you? Or are you going to make? Well, that's perhaps the question you asked here about our year. The first year, which we put our first whiskey into cask in December 2018, we spent 2019 going through. Remaking whiskey because if you think about it, we're making whiskeys here, no one's made in 200 years. Now, how do you make them? Even with John's experience, we're looking at a mash bill going, How the hell? Are they? 
How are we going to make this? Or you make it and you're going to yield a 4%. We're going to choose 4% that. Yeah. How do we increase that? So you run it again, you change your strength temperatures, you change your yeast, you, you change the way you brew, you leave a longer fermentation, a hotter fermentation. So you tweak and you turn, you, you get your yields up to 5%, 6%, maybe 7%. So you're pushing. And then what you would be standard? 10% the standard, right? Six to seven. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because we use a lot of old, we use a lot of grains that really aren't used for yield, they're used for flavor. Flavor is what we're after here, you know? And I think the reason a lot of these grains were dumped in Irish whiskey when the industry was in trouble in the 50s and 60s is because they were a costing output. They weren't efficient enough. So it was to help with the consumer and how our whiskey tastes. We don't frankly care. We want to make it as efficient as we possibly can. Where here we're going, what's the flavor? How can we get flavor into this whiskey? Okay, well, let's, let's go heritage grains. Let's have the grains grown for us. Let's mill on site. Let's use long fermentations. Let's just play with all this technology we have to extract. Let's not distill above 71, 72 percent. Let's let's keep those congeners. Let's go. Let's 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 do this in a in a in a way that's going to you know empower the consumer. So then, double distillation. Why more flavor? You know, we're not getting to 92 percent ethanol here because ethanol tastes of nothing. Hey, big vodka, news! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, the vodka. We're not. So our yield, our yields here are slow, are low. Our, our, our fermentations are slow. It's about relearning how to make whiskey. So year one was was miserable. I, I don't know how much we made. We made about 50 different test mashes, about 50 different recipes. Some were spectacularly good. Some we make a few times, and they were still pretty tragic. We made one. I forgot what year it's from. It was a high, high wheat, wheat, high wheat whiskey. It wasn't it's a bit dry, not very nice. So we haven't gone back and made that again. We've now brought it down to a handful that we, we really, really like. So this year we had intended, you know, scaling and and, and but obviously this COVID thing is now not just for six, and so we're, we're kind of we we, we re reduced output again just to try to get through this. So currently, there's probably about there could be about a dozen, two dozen, maybe two dozen different separate non-compliant whiskies that we have in cask maturing. And um, we had our first tasting session in March, tasting stock that was about nine months to you know a year old. Uh, and we will go back and we we'll revisit at Christmas, and again every six months we'll do it. Do and will that be yes. blended together or will it be single cast or just batch releases? Any plans? Batch releases is my theory right now. I mean, there's no point doing this and then mixing them all together. It's kind of pointless, really. No, I, I can see batch releases because there are some interesting batches. We will probably then focus on one that we think is the most exciting and uh, bring that one to the market. But at the moment, we're you know we're still circling that. All right. Well, tell us a little bit about the normal fermentation at the moment. Is it Five days, three days, what do you normally do? Normally it's just over 100 hours. Okay. So about 100 hours is about standard. We don't have heated or chilled fermenters. So in the summer, it's a little bit faster. In the winter, it's a little bit slower. But again, we were kind of led by the product rather than, you know, we let it bring us, we don't bring it. So, you know, you come here someday and you just, you know, you're going to be doing something and you get in here and it's not quite ready, so you do something. That's just the way it is at Blackwater, where you know we, we, we kind of like to know that anything we put in cask is, is, is as best as we can make it. And if we have to wait another day to do a distillation, we wait. Okay. And now what type of yeast do you use? You mentioned experimenting also with yeast, which can be very, give very rare a, a variety of results. Yeah, no, we've, I mean, you need to ask John that. Um, I don't know, I just find the chat. Uh, a, a wide variety. I know we are now we settled on one this year that John's very happy with. Um, I think he's going to switch again next week. We're going to make and it's back to the question asked earlier about, about rye. I mean, we do a rye here. It's fifty-one percent because I agree with that comment. I don't think a thirty-one percent is not a rye. Fifty-one above, yeah, great. So we're doing a fifty-one percent rye. We've done it already, um, and we're going to change the yeast to one that John worked with in the states. Which will bring out those sort of ripe plum notes. Uh, I can't even pronounce it. But it's, don't worry. Don't worry. It's down now, Walter asked, "Will it be possible to get some casks, um, maybe for a private? Do you have a private cask program?" No, we don't. 
We're not, we're not doing one. Two reasons. One, we don't need to for cash. And two, I would like to control our whiskey stock. The exception to that is if you're a whiskey society. So like we were going to do a, a cast for the Irish Whiskey Society literally a fortnight ago. The week we went into lockdown, so that didn't happen. We will do them for societies. Um, so SN, SN, SNWS maybe as well if they asked. Yeah, any society, any group of uh, you know in, interested individuals, with one caveat is you come here and you have naked. Okay, that's it's all you know. That, not going to cost you anything extra. But we want you to be here. We want you to see what we do, how we do, it, and we want you to help us do it. I like that. That's great. All right, very, very good. If you are, if you, if you're gonna, I, I don't understand people who invest in casks. Um, at this moment in time, I think you 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 gotta be very very careful. But in our point of view, if you're buying a cask, it's because we've approved, we like what you do, we like you, we've met you, and uh, we want you to be, come on the journey with us. Um, what we tend to do then is we tend to go like, well, what is it you want to make? And that really floors people because normally you go somewhere and you're told you can have a wheat, you can have this, you can have that. We go, well, what do you make? Um, so with the guys from RHBC said they, were going to, they wanted to make a, a, a mash bill that Charlie Roach found from the 1820s. So we were all set up to do that, and they couldn't come. We made it anyway. Very nice. So when they come back, we probably make it. All right, very good. Alistair asked, and sometimes the problem with internet is people come and go. Um, when will you <laughs> be releasing your first whiskies? I would imagine probably 2022. But, but but we were just talking about about what we might do, and we what we might do is we might release. Um, we might release not new make because that's basically putching, which is itself is a different kind of shit show. We may well release something like a one year old and then a two year old and then a three. A oh, work in not, progress, though. Yeah, so well. yeah, not, they're not risky legally. Uh, um, but we don't, our new make is quite different to most people's new make in that because of the way we make it, we're not over relying on the wood. The wood is a polish for us. The new make itself needs to have a lot of character. So our new make or a one year old. Okay, it's still it's still young, but we know we have to sell our whiskey early-ish. You know, we're not made of cash here, so we have to sell it. We have to sell something in three years. So we're deliberately another thing taking very narrow cuts. So when we when we when we distill and we're we're laying stock down at the moment, we're laying it down knowing it's going to be so quite young. So we're, we're you know the stuff that you were allowed time to take and evaporate, we're just not collecting it in the first place. So as a result, this. The new make spirit has got less of that spirit bite that you associate with new make. Um, and at one year old, you know, it's it's pleasant, it's very nice. So we were thinking we might do something at one year, two years, three years. We're still kicking, and we have stuff that's over a year old. It's like 18 months old. But we're, we're still, you know, we're just still finding our way. And again, I think this year now is gone. I think it's a project we might do next year. Because this year, to be honest, just getting through the year will be enough for anybody without having to to deal with other stuff. It's very good. Now, Alicia, um, she said you were selling certificates of ownerships for bottles yes! a while back, maybe 2014 or so. She bought one for a pot still whiskey and one for a single malt whiskey. When can she roughly <laughs> expect something? 2022. Thank you. Yes, we did. Back in 2014, when we first opened up, we, we did sell, pre-sell, not many now, just a handful of the first 2014 bottles. Um, um, we have we have all the certificates, we have all the details of all the owners. Um, only last week we were looking at them going, wow, this is fantastic. So yeah, we're gonna have a big party for those people. And um, yeah, you will get your, you'll get it in 20, 2022. It's a bit of a wait, I'm sorry, but it'll be worthwhile. And we do thank you very much for, for putting your faith in us back in 2014. Wow, way before I was even the whiskey scene, that was... All right, um, David asked, do you think the likes of Pernod and Beam Centauri will leave you alone with regards to labeling? We learned yesterday that somebody complained about one of J.J. Corey's bottles. Um... Yeah, I mean, look, labeling is interesting. Labels have to be approved. But there's an interesting point between what you can put on a label that is compliant with a technical file and what you can put in a label that is a, a certifiable fact. So. Okay. 
It's two years away, so I'm not going to sweat it too much. Uh, Thomas Gucko says, which casks will be used in the future? Is all ex bourbon, or do you have some special maybe wine casks or other special stuff? That's he loves he loves scalp casks. Cask, by the way. Oh, do you? Oh, he does. He does. I like him. He loves them. Uh, hang on a second. He likes stout casks. <laughs> so let's get this big so everyone can see here. Very, very good. So we have stouted whiskey, Blackwater stouted whiskey. Wow. The 8th of April, 2020. So Gokko should stout. be here. Very, very pleased to see that. Tell me a little bit more about the other casks. Well, basically, no. What we do is we we because um, I ordered in a load of casks before John arrived. Uh, just taking a stab in the dark, and John put manners on me. So, what, on our first year when we'd make uh, a new make, we got quarter casks, and we put every new make into a different quarter cask. So you'd divide it up into. Uh, we'd virgin American, virgin European, bourbon, rebuild sherry, uh, and a few other wild cards. So the spirit was put into these quarter casks and left for about six months to get a sense of where it was going to go, it kind of accelerated aging to give you a sense of where the spirit would be, which would work better. We don't want to do as a small distillery, put all our stuff into a cask type. And then realize three years later, that's the wrong cast. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, whoops. So um, that was very interesting. And what we found is not surprisingly to you know drinkers of red breast, is there is an affinity between mixed mash bill pots of whiskey and sherry wood. There is an absolute affinity. It it there it does work. And as you go back to the time period we're talking about, there were no bourbon casks. In Ireland, there were no bourbon casks till um, after Second World War, so late 40s, early 50s. So everything, all Irish whiskey, was fortified wines or stout or ciders. They they were the cast. Oh, ciders again. Yeah, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. Sorry, I'll, I'll back to that. Yeah, that that is interesting. So they were mostly fortified wines. Um, now, what you could say is that at this point in time, if I was to give you a pot still whiskey made the way they made it in the early part of the 20th century, and I was to age it for its entire duration of seven years in a sherry cask. To the modern palate, it probably would be too much. You probably just overload. And to be honest, it might just be a little bit overcooked anyway. So um, what we are doing is we are on the back of that experiment. We're putting the whiskey into what we think are the barrels that work best. And so far, the ones that work best or uh, sherry, um, bourbon, rye, stout. That's it. No what rum, we went to, no pork. Uh, no, at this stage, no. But, for example, I mentioned the wheat whiskey earlier. That's just in the bourbon barrel. We have a feeling that in two years' time, uh, it might well do with a year in rum. I think so, too. Yeah, I could imagine that, actually. Yeah, <laughs> So this is the whole thing as finishing casks is something that we would look at in, in a couple of years' time. So at the moment, that's that's our cask policy at the moment right now. I'll go back to the cider. Yes, cider. Cider is uh, an interesting one. Mm, sorry. This is hello, can I ring you back? Thank you. No idea. It's no problem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, cider, cider is cider is an amazing Irish product, and it's it's kind of overlooked. But it, yeah, the, the problem with cider casks and whiskey is that the esters you get from cider sometimes with a whiskey don't quite work. It kind of tastes like you've done the cut too early. And there's a couple of Tullamore juice, for example, in in, in apple casks, which for me just don't work. It just me neither. Like, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so you do have to be very careful how you handle apple. Um, and we have actually done some apple apple spirit ourselves here last month to season some casks as well. We were going to try, there's one or two whiskeys we've made which we think might work, might work. So we, yeah, it's a house of experimentation. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Very, very interesting. Now, do you have a visitor center where people can actually come by and drop by and get a tour? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sitting in it. Beautiful. Yeah, and we do. The, the new building here in, 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 in Bali, where we're based, the new distillery, which opened uh, 
18 months ago now. Um, we were due around now to have a grand opening. Um, we got our licenses and everything in March, just before it closed down. So, um, yes, we are due to open. When that'll be, I don't know. I mean, unlike most distilleries you're going to come to in Ireland, this is not um, a virtual experience. This is the working distillery. So it's quite nice. It's quite intimate in the way that Valley Keith is quite intimate. You can oh, come here. That's and, actually you know, a hard <laughs> if you just enjoy. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're just we're in a in a, a hardware store in the middle of a small Irish village. And basically, what happens is there's a gate down below me. This window here, uh, window there, and just below that there's there's a gate. And uh, what happens is the uh, the barley arrives in through the gate, and we've done a mash. The barley goes back out through that gate and then there's a house just there and beyond the house is cows and the cows eat it so it's, it's very like valley keith but it's not a farm but it's in the middle of a small village uh so yes there there is a, there's a visitor center it's kind of ready to go but we we, we can't open just yet all right very very all good right. so look ned's there hey ned there's ned hey ned how's oh, it going ned's a great guy ned, i love ned's him ned's doing, ned's doing great work in waterford and again they were due to release their whiskey in April, and um, that has to be put off now as well. I mean, the world's a very funny place at the moment, but um, yeah, it's great to have neighbors like like Ned down there. Crazy times, crazy times. Now imagine um, it does calm down. Will you be at Whiskey Live in Dublin in November? We will. Yes, we will. We Were will. you there we last will. year? Um, no, we haven't gone back since 2014 See. because 2014 we, we were opening, and it was like we were new and. There was only about three micro distilleries in the country. There was Dingle, there was Glendalough, and there was us. I think and that was it. That was so yeah, really, we did. We really in the up. beginning. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> really, and then we haven't been back since because there's no point going back because we don't have whiskey. But we are. I mean, we mentioned Repsonot earlier on. Um, we are going to release another Bonder brand, uh, which is this one here. All right, this go for it. World exclusive. And uh, Velvet Cap is a Bonder brand that was based on the Dungarvan. Um, so it would have been um, around until the 50s in Ireland. And um, we're doing this really for a couple of reasons. We're doing it again out of transparency. It says in the back, we haven't made it. It's it's a source whiskey. Um, we're, but we are doing it because we need to open up relationships with importers, take our own whiskey when it comes on stream. And there's no point knocking on someone's door in, in two years time and going, hey, I got a case, do you want to buy it? to get lost so what you're going to got to do now is kind of open the channels of communication with this and this again is playing into our um, experience here with using different tasks and stuff and going back to how whiskey would have been handled in ireland uh, in the period up to the 50s when distilleries didn't bottle their own whiskey the distilleries made whiskey that was their job and they would sell the new make on to bonders who would then depending on what 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 wines or or Red spot, and, green spot, yellow spot. We know those today, right? Mm -hmm. This is another one. This is this is another one of those brands. All right. <laughs> and uh, it's just an again, it gives us a chance now to try the retinol project, which scaled up to a large scale. That was a one-off. It was like 1,100, 1,200 bottles. It was nothing. This is a much larger project, and again, it allows us to get our bottling line operational, to get all our procedures in place, to get all our uh, uh, revenue compliances for bottling to do the whole lot ahead of our own launch in about, about two years time so we would you like to kind of I'll come back background in television you don't do anything live for the first time in other words when you do something make sure you've rehearsed it so this for us is a, again is a more focused rehearsal on what we're going to do ourselves very good. I think you have an uh, importer here in Germany. At least the Retronaut went through Irish whiskies with Marika. She hopefully, and she has some of your gin as well. So at least you have one country. What other countries do you export to with your gin? And what, where can we expect the whiskey then to land in the next um, couple of years? 2020, I think, is your release date. Uh, the gins are Australia, UK, Canada, uh, France, Germany, Poland. I can't remember. The, 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 your usual EU type type countries. Whiskey, um, whiskey probably very, very similar because I mean a lot of the people who are taking the gin will take the whiskey. 
And as I said, a lot of other countries who don't want our gin, because let's face it, the whole point of a gin is that it's 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 very much you know a local thing. So uh, it's whereas Irish whiskey can only be made in Ireland. So from the point of view of us as a trying to develop relationships, it's good for us to have something like Velvet Camp. All right, very good. Now the last question I always like to ask is, what did I forget to ask? What would you like to say that you have that you have not yet mentioned? I don't know. Um, I think, um, I think that's it, really. Come and see us sometime. Seriously, yeah. I mean, not just you, but everyone watching. I mean, as I say, we are completely open for what we do. Um, come and spend the day. Just come and hang out. I mean, we have interestingly, we had some guys come up to South Africa who were just doing a whiskey tour of Ireland very early this year, and uh, they came in here. We hadn't got the place set up yet. We gave them a tour around the show sat them down and gave them a cup of tea. <clears throat> and about an hour later, they're still sitting. We have lovely soft chairs overlooking the stills. And when I said, you all right? They went, oh yeah. You don't know what it's like just to sit here in a distillery and just listen to the stills. Because it's not an experience you, you can get in many places because you're not, it's quite small and intimate. And if you want to sit there in a balcony and drink cups of tea <laughs> and uh, knock yourself out, but yeah, and I've forgotten for my own nerd years as a whiskey enthusiast, I remember going to Talisker an awful long time ago and do something very, very similar, just standing there looking at the stills for probably an hour. And that's the kind of thing you can do here. So yeah, come along and nerd out, it'd be great. Very, very good. The unsung legend of Blackwater. <laughs> and Dave, David says that here, yeah, excellent. That's Kieran, who I mentioned earlier on. Yes, yeah, indeed. Very good. Glenn actually said one of the best live interviews I've seen in the last few weeks. Well done, Jason and Peter. Loved your book, by the way. Very, very good. And they will actually have a live stream with uh, Michael Carr here from Pierce Lyons Distillery. All right. Show the book again. That's great. Thank you very much. All right. Very, very good stuff. Thank you very much for the stream. Well, Peter, I look forward to making it over one day. I look forward to seeing you in Dublin at Whiskey Live and to continue to learn from you. You were one of the, I've, I've read your blogs for the last couple of years, off and on that every single one, and I've learned a lot from you. I really must admit, um, even your books, one of them I actually have over there in my in my um, bookcase, I have to go buy that last book you, um, you just showed because I don't have that yet. There's so much to learn from you. You are really one of those um, pillars, I think, of Irish whiskey history. Thank you very much. Before you go, I'll give your listeners a little. The great thing of having a small micro distillery with Wi Fi is I can get my computer and I can just bring you and I'll just show you very quickly. So that, that's my office. Oh, God, this is the boardroom, which is a total mess. Uh, and then, listen, through this door here, this is where the magic happens. See? Oh, yeah. I like how you still have that banister there. It really still has that feel a little bit of the hardware store. Yeah. And there's the soft chairs over there. You see the soft chairs under the window? Yeah. There's the soft chairs, and there's the stills. It is actually all quite intimate here. And, uh, and we're back again. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was fabulous, Peter. Can't can't wait to learn more from you and to talk to you again and actually be there. All right. So. Anytime. Then Thanks very much. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye bye.